Okay, welcome to this semester's symposium on the Middle East, focused especially on Syria and Afghanistan. Um, we're going to give an overview of all the actors influencing the region, especially um, in terms of what we talked in our last symposium, in terms of uh, Russian and U.S. influences. We're also going to bring in Turkey tonight, especially when we're discussing Syria. Um, thank you so much for coming out in this weather, and uh, please do sign in. Um, uh, the sign in uh, is mainly a way for us to just track our attendance and to send you a survey so we can get your input. Um, so yeah, so please do sign in. And um, the event tonight will be um, an hour and a half. Um, actually, since we're starting a little bit late, it'll be an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I do want to let people get home and have dinner and everything. Um, so, you know, just, just to bear that in mind, we're going to have very brief presentations and we hope to have a robust Q&A for half an hour after the presentations, uh, maybe a little longer depending on how many questions we have. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, we're going to start tonight um, with Alain Payan. He's the director of the center. He's going to give background information and he's going to share his field experience in Afghanistan. Um, Dr. Payan uh, is the director of the Middle East Studies Center. Um, he's also a founding member of the National Council of Area Studies Center Directors and a board member and former president of the Eastern Consortium in Persian and Turkish. Um, he was the Director General of Cultural and Foreign Relations at Kabul University. And he's been serving here for the past 30 years. Um, Dr. Payan got his PhD at Indiana University and um, soon after that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. <laughs> and um, so we're very fortunate and that, uh, you know, to have him here and, um, you know, to share his experience and he still maintains connections in Afghanistan. He goes back nearly every year. Um, he, he meets with the highest officials in the country. Um, and so he'll be kicking off the evening and then we'll have Dr. Amr al-Azam. He's an associate professor of Middle East history and anthropology at Shawnee State University. Um, Dr. Elazam was educated in the UK, uh, reading Archaeology of Western Asiatics at the University College of London. He graduated with a doctoral degree in 1991. He was the director of scientific and conservation laboratories at the General Department of Antiquities and Museums and taught at the University of Damascus until 2006. From 2006 to 2009, he became a visiting associate, I'm sorry, assistant professor at Brigham Young University. And currently, he's Associate Professor of Middle East History at Shawnee State. Whilst working in Syria, Amr al-Azam was a first-hand observer and sometime participant of the reform processes instigated by, by Bashar al-Assad, gaining insights into how they were enacted and why, more often than not, they failed. Furthermore, he is an outspoken member of the Syrian opposition and a keen follower and commentator on current events in Syria and the Middle East in general. He's appeared um, as a Syrian expert on leading television networks, including CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, PBS, and his voice can be heard regularly on NPR. And he's written numerous articles, um, numerous journal articles and articles for media outlets, including editorials for the New York Times and Time Magazine. He's a founder and board member on the Day After Project and currently manages the Heritage Protection Initiative, or Cultural Heritage Protection um, in Syria. Um, another thing to know about the, uh, Dr. Al-Azam is that his research pertains to um, cultural heritage sites, um, archaeological heritage, and um, how they're used politically. So during Q&A, uh, that might be something you'd want to bring up. And he will be um, discussing mainly um, Syria, but also um, kind of give an overview of how in Syria the activities are driven so much by the U.S., Russia, and Turkey right now. And then um, Dr. Um, Richard Herman, um, he's also the chair of the political science department here at Ohio State University. Um, he has um, field experience um, 
in our in the U.S. government. Um, so, so uh, from 1989 to 91, he was a member of Secretary Secretary of State James Baker's policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State. From 1992 to 95. He worked with the U.S. Information Agency to hold conflict resolution workshops for scholars and policymakers from India, Pakistan, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, Algeria, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the United States. In 1996 and 97, he was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations um, of New York Task Force that introduced the book of Differentiated, Differentiated Containment, Rethinking U.S. Policy in the Gulf. Um, and I also happen to know from students, um, he is a well-loved professor here at Ohio State and he does these simulations in his classes as well. Um, the reason we're bringing these scholars together is that um, they're, they're very good speakers. They all have field experience in addition to their scholarship and their, and their research here as professors. And they're really able to encapsulate a lot of knowledge in, in you know, a short period of time and then to really unpack what they presented in the Q&A. So, you know, I'm um, really um, delighted to be here. And, oh, and I forgot to introduce myself. I'm the Assistant Director of the Middle East Studies Center. My name is Melinda McClyman. Um, if you have any questions about our work, please, you know, come up afterwards. Um, we're passing around a, a sheet that has our Facebook page. It's, that's the best place to keep up with our events besides our, our website, which has an events calendar, but sometimes things come up that we could just share on Facebook, and we'd love to engage with you online. Um, please consider giving us a donation. These events do cost money, and uh, your engagement is another way to kind of, you know, pay it forward or to um, make it worth our while, so just being here really is payment in itself, but there's also the option to, to donate, and that's, uh, there's a link to that on the sheet that's going around as well. So, um, Dr. Plan, I'll get you set up here. Um, is this working? Yeah. Okay. So let me know okay. if there's anything else you need. Thank you very, thank you very much, Belinda. Um, um, I would like to thank the Middle East Studies Center. Um, as, as the director of the Middle East Studies Center, I would like to thank uh, the Murshan Center in the Shani State University for supporting this symposium, um, uh, focusing on Syria and Afghanistan, two of the hot spots um, in both of these countries, superpowers are involved, and super terrorist groups are involved too, uh, from the Shia terrorist group of Hezbollah, to Daesh or ISIS or ISIL, uh, to Al Qaeda, to Al Nusra, Al Khurasan, Taliban, Jaish al Islam, and this and that. There are many groups that I'm not going to list all of. So these are all, in one way or the other, in, involved either in in Syria or Afghanistan. Uh, in my multiple trips to Syria. Turkey, uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, one thing that I repeatedly hear from my colleagues there is that uh, when someone listens to the American mass media, because they're, they're listening to um, CNN, uh, MSNBC, the Fox television, uh, the argument that they're presenting is that uh, one, uh, for example, that a Russian plane was shot by rebels uh, in, in, in Syria, and one Russian pilot who ejected and then he was killed later, that makes a bigger news than hundreds of Syrian civilians are killed, are still hundreds and literally thousands of civilians in Afghanistan are killed. Those do not make news. And another complaint by uh, Afghans and Syrians and Iraqis and others uh, is that uh, when these countries are covered, very little background information is given uh, to the people. So for that reason, I 
usually begin with some sort of background information. Uh, I will focus on two issues today. One is that the geostrategic location of both Syria and Afghanistan, then move to the heavy price paid by what the Arabic and Persian world they are using for non-combatant civilian victims, awam, the term that they are using, that nobody is paying attention to this awam, the non-combatant civilian victims, that how many of them are dying. So for that reason, I will just give some statistics that how many Syrians have died, how many Afghans have died in the past uh, 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 over a decade uh, in both of these countries, especially in Afghanistan uh, in the past 30 years, in Syria uh, in the past seven years. Uh, I'm not comparing these two countries. They are very different in many ways. Uh, it is true uh, that Syria and Afghanistan are different in many ways. Uh, one is located uh, in in the Middle East, another one is located in Central Asia or South Asia, uh, which is Afghanistan. Uh, in many ways they are different, but in many other ways there are striking similarities between uh, Afghanistan uh, and Syria. Uh, historians of both of these countries, that I have talked to them when I go there, Syrian historians and Afghan historians, they forcefully argue that the geostrategical location of both of these countries have determined the histories of these two countries. The locations have to do a great deal to explain to us that why the situation in both of these countries happened in the past and happening right now. Uh, let, let me give some background to that. Uh, during the ancient period, Sumerians, Egyptians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Hittites civilization surrounded Syria. Uh, in the same ancient period, uh, the Persian Empire, the Chinese Empire, and the Indian Empire uh, surrounded Afghanistan, which is here. So here is China. It's not in the map here. This is the subcontinent of India. That was the Indian civilization, the Chinese civilization, and here is the Persian civilization. Uh, in the case of Syria, it was the this is a Mesopotamian civilization. That's what that was the Egyptian civilization. Uh, then there was the uh, later uh, the Greek civilization, then the Romans and the Byzantines. So these were all the Hittites in Turkey. So there were all these major powers that surrounded these countries. And throughout the history they were invaded multiple times by, by these surrounding big huge powerful empires. Uh, that's one thing that they were surrounded by these empires and another fact is that both of these countries Afghanistan and Syria here they were both located on the crossroads of migration uh, trade the Silk Road begins in China here passed through Afghanistan and the last area was Syria here in Damascus, you could see the silk industry which developed in China. All these countries on the road had this Syria still silk industry, uh, Damascus when I was there. It's a beautiful city. I went to Syria three times. Uh, so that, and also Afghanistan was located on the trade route. These trade routes were used by the, the, by the conquerors uh, in different periods. Uh, uh, so this Silk Road and the Spice Road, both, and there is another route too, we talked about the Silk Road, the Spice Road which begins in India. Also, so, so these two countries, Afghanistan and Syria, were located on the confluence of the trade routes, the routes of migration, and, and the routes of, of, of conquest throughout the history. Uh, the cities, the three major cities in Syria uh, became uh, the long distance centers of trade, uh, Damascus, Aleppo, and Palmyra. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, Kabul, Herat, Bamiyan uh, uh, were, were, the, were the three major uh, cities that which were on, the, on, uh, on those trade routes. And those trade routes at one point became military garrisons for the invading armies. Now I will just go to some differences and similarities between these two countries. Uh, I will just begin with the similarities. Both, both Syria and in Afghanistan are Muslim majority countries. Both are members of the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation. 
comprising of the 57 Muslim majority countries. In both countries, Sunnis form the overwhelming majority. This is a fact. Afghanistan is almost 80%, 85% Sunni, and Syria is 85% Sunni. But we will come to the differences. In Afghanistan, the Sunnis are the rulers, are the, the power is concentrated in the hands of the Sunnis. But in Syria, this, the, the Alawite, which is a branch of the Sunnis, they have only about between 11 to 15 percent estimates. These are estimates. But they are controlling government in Syria. So this is one of the reasons that which uh, there is a, a, a sort of uh, conflict in Syria. So in both of these countries, Sunnis form the majority. Both were and are located on the trade routes. Both were occupied by the Achaemenian Iranians, Persians, in 550 BC, by Macedonians. Both Afghanistan and Syria were taken by the Persians. And the Macedonians, when Alexander the Great came, took Syria and e Egypt and other places, and then came to Afghanistan in 330 BC. Uh, both of these countries were occupied by the Arabs, Muslims, in the 7th century AD. So the Arabs came and took Syria in 637 AD, and toward the end of the 7th, uh, the, the seventh century, the Arab armies were in Afghanistan. Both of these countries, after the Muslim Arabs, uh, came the Chinggis Khan, the Mongol horde. Uh, they captured Afghanistan in 1220, and then they went to Syria a little bit later. The descendants of Chinggis Khan went to Syria in 1270. So Syria was also occupied uh, by the Chinggisi forces. Both countries were involved in the post-World War II Cold War competition, Syria and Afghanistan. The important factor here is that in Syria, the communist pro-Soviet Communist Party was launched in 1944. In Afghanistan, the pro-Soviet, that party's name was Al-Hizb al al-Shuri, al uh, which is the, 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 the Communist Party of Syria in 1944. In Afghanistan, Hizb al-Democratic Khalq, which the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, PGPA, was launched uh, in 1965. So Syria had a communist party before Afghanistan had. Uh, that was the year that Syria declared its independence, but was not recognized in Syria, was recognized in 1946 uh, as an independent country. In the 1950s and the 1960s, both Afghanistan and Syria were sending their military officers for training to the Soviet Union. Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafiz al-Assad, was sent to the Soviet Union uh, in 1957, and he became a pilot, uh, was trained to become the, he became the pilot of the, what do you call this, the first generation of the MiG, uh, MiG planes in Russia, MiG-17. Uh, and in Afghanistan also the military officers were, were, were sent to the, the Soviet Union during the time of Khrushchev and Bulgan in, in the post-Stalin period. Uh, me, the, 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 the irony is here that in both Syria and in Afghanistan, this pro-Soviet our Soviet trained military officers participated in the coup in both of these countries. So Bashar al-Assad's Bashar al -Assad's father, Hafiz al-Assad, uh, in 1970 uh, took control of the government. And in Afghanistan later, the, 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 the Democratic, People's Democratic Party of, uh, which PDPA, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, they did the coup and many of the military officers were trained in the, in the Soviet Union. So now these are the similarities. Let me go to the differences. The size of Afghanistan is 552,000 uh, 552, square miles. Syria is about 71,000 square miles. It's almost less than, less than one third of, of the Afghan, Afghanistan size. Uh, the Afghanistan population is about 30 million, and the Syrian population is estimated about 18 million. And I, I mentioned the differences that uh, in Syria, uh, 15 or 14 percent of the Alawite minority is ruling over the 85 percent majority. So, okay, now this is one of the. Um, in, in, in Syria, uh, there are Arabs, the language is Arabic. In Afghanistan, the majority of the people are Pashtuns and Tajiks. Both of them are Indo European people. Both are speaking two languages. Tajiks are speaking Persian, and Pashtuns are speaking Pashto, which are both. Uh, branches of the, uh, the Indo-Iranian languages, which belong to the larger family of the Indo-European language family. 
uh, Afghanistan was invaded by the Soviet Union from 1979 to 1918, 1989, 10 full years. This did not happen to Syria. So these are the differences. The Syrian government of, the current government of Bashar al-Assad is supported by the Soviet Union, by, the, by Russia, which inherited the Soviet Union, and by Iran. And the Afghan government during Hamid Karzai's, from September the 11th, the Afghan government is supported militarily and financially and economically by the United States and the NATO forces in Afghanistan. Um, one of the, the differences is that Syria after Syria was ruled for almost about 400 years by the Ottoman Turks until it became independent. When in World War I uh, Ottoman Empire was defeated and the Ottoman Empire was chopped by the British and the French. Uh, Syria became a mandate of the, of, the, of, the, of the France and Iraq and Jordan and Palestine became a mandate of Iraq. So they, 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 they divided the Ottoman Empire. The same thing did not, the Romans, the d big major difference is the Romans, the Byzantines, Ottomans and the Crusaders, they all occupied, conquered Syria. They did not reach Afghanistan. Ottomans and, and, and Byzantine and Roman Empire were prevented to go eastward by the two powerful empires of Persia. One was during the Sasanian period and later the Safavid period. So they prevent, this is one reason. So what was the thrust of the, of the Ottomans were west, westward, not eastward, because there was a very powerful empire of the Persians preventing that. So that really saved Afghanistan in some ways. Now I'm going a little bit fast forward. Uh, after World War I, Syria became a French mandate. Uh, Afghanistan remained independent. Now I'll just skip some of my, Melinda, how many minutes I have? Um, a few more minutes. Okay, all right. Um, For the Soviet Union, the campaign in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989, ten year, full ten years the Soviet Union was in Afghanistan, uh, it was one of the longest wars for, the, for Russia. I would mean Russia and the Soviet Union if you combine both of them. But for the United States, the war in Afghanistan has become the longest in its history. The war of Afghanistan for the United States has become now longer than the war of independence, uh, longer than the Civil War, longer than both war, World War I and World War II combined, longer than the Korean War, and longer than the Vietnam War. So this is the 17th year that the United States uh, is in Afghanistan. In victory for the U.S. supported, or the NATO supported government in Afghanistan still remains an elusive dream for the Afghan government. Uh, President Trump became the third the president inherited the war in Afghanistan and still we hear from him that he is determined to win the war in Afghanistan militarily. Uh, some people think that it's almost impossible if the current policies would continue. Yeah, one of the things that I did not mention that I should have because my Syrian and Afghan colleagues are telling me that and that it, they do not get this kind of coverage. Uh, in Afghanistan during the 10 year of the Soviet occupation 1.2 million Afghans were killed. Seven million of them became refugees in Pakistan and Iran and other countries. So seven million. At that time, Afghanistan had about 19 million people. Exactly the same what Syria is today. So after 19 million, 1.2 million were killed. Seven million became refugees in other countries. Eight million Afghans became internally displaced. I go each year and I see that, including my relatives. Uh, Soviet casualties in Afghanistan were estimated at 45,000. And no, uh, about 15,000 were killed and 45,000. The ratio was one to three. So that in the case of Syria, uh, 
Five million became refugees in the neighboring countries. Six million internally displaced. And a little less than half a million in Syria have been killed. Um, so these are the statistics. And in all of these invasions uh, by outsiders, uh, during the invasion of Syria in Afghanistan by outsiders, so when the outsiders leave, what they do, then the country, it's followed by, uh, by, by the sectarian wars, by minority against the majority. It's exactly happened to Syria each time when the foreign have left. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, the same thing happened when the Soviet Union left Afghanistan. Uh, other countries also left Afghanistan, so it led to the Tajik Pashtun, uh, radical Islamist versus the moderate Islamist. So that war continues. Uh, so this is the situation in both of these countries. Thank you very much. see the maps otherwise too well. <clears throat> oh. Is that like, okay? I am fine, but it's... Uh, Those who don't hear you fall asleep? Uh, <laughs> they're okay. They don't mind falling asleep. <laughs> uh, right. So, Syria. Um... This is probably the third time I've spoken here in the Mirshan, the fourth time I've spoken here. Uh, actually, the fourth time, not the third time. This is the fourth time I've spoken here in the Mirshan about Syria. Initially, when this conflict began, um, most people in the heydays of the 2011 Arab Spring there's a lot of optimism, uh, you know, when we looked at Egypt, we looked at Tunis, even Libya. Um, everybody was essentially predicting a rapid collapse of the regime. And I remember in conversations with uh, uh, individuals uh, from State Department, senior people in the State Department, uh, you know, who uh, in 2011 basically were saying, oh, um, we just have to, you know, how do we get Assad to understand that he has to go? Or how, do, how, do we, how, do we, how do how do we, how do we get him to sort of, you know, all, all he needs, he just needs to recognize that it's over and he needs to leave. And I'm, uh, I'm almost quoting verbatim, uh, people who know better. Uh, in, I, I think it was October 2011, I participated in an exercise uh, to try and predict how long it would take for the Syrian conflict to end. By October, by the fall of 2011, it was obvious that Bashar was not going to leave. And uh, in August we had several statements by the then US administration, first by Clinton, then by Obama, where it was publicly stated for the first time he had to leave, followed, I believe, on August 9th, a statement by Erdogan, who for the first time publicly stated that Bashar al-Assad was uh, dishonest and, and had lied to him and therefore he should also be required to leave and uh, but there was no to the contrary what we were seeing on the ground was a escalation and a, a full engagement by the military uh, to crush the opposition which was inevitable that this was going to be matched by a militarization 
of the opposition to counter that. So you were already drifting towards a conflict. And many of us at that time were thinking, okay, so we're heading towards a Benghazi-style scenario. Uh, Benghazi meaning, by Benghazi scenario, I mean when uh, Gaddafi in the spring, late spring of uh, 2011, decided to send his tanks um, to to crush the rebellion in in in, in uh, Libya, and uh, the international community responded by launching airstrikes and against that column of tanks and burnt those tanks on their way to uh, Benghazi and essentially started the the war that ultimately ended in Gaddafi's demise. So in Syria, we were kind of looking at the trajectory, thinking, okay, clearly uh, Bashar al-Assad and his regime were not going to take the easy shot, uh, the easy option, and, and leave like Ben Ali did in Tunis or Mubarak did in Egypt. They were going to go the hard way. They were going to go the Gaddafi way. So uh, the people like myself were sitting there trying to figure out what was going to be the trigger, what was going to be the tipping point that would trigger an international intervention, Benghazi style, that would essentially, uh, with airstrikes and with everything else to come. And so with that in mind, I was participating in this exercise trying to predict when the conflict would end. And I, uh, I essentially said 18 months from the end of, uh, you know, the, from October 2011. I said 18 months hence, and I predicted 250,000 dead. And, uh, most of the people in the room were very upset with me. They felt that I was extremely pessimistic, that it was almost like I was trying to sort of present such a bleak outlook that this would discourage people from either wanting to continue or uh, the international community from wanting to participate. And, and I was like, no, be realistic. You know, um, if you start, if, if tomorrow the international community steps in and we trigger a Benghazi, and, and it was all based on the number of refugees that would start to flow as a result of this increased militarization by the regime against the opposition in Aleppo, in Deir Zor, in Hama, in Homs, and so on and so forth, and, and obviously in the south, south of the country. And uh, would, it be, would it take 50,000 refugees? Would it take 100,000 refugees? You know, what would happen if 150,000? And, and the number kept climbing, but there was no tip. It never came. And so, of course, my prediction that 18 months and 250,000, based on just I looked at Libya and I said, look, Libya had 5 million, a population of 5 million. Syria actually has closer to 23 million. Um, 23 million, do the math, you, you know, the Libyans lost 50,000 in so many months, so 18 months, we're going to, uh, with that size of population, we're going to lose 250,000. I wish today that we had lost 250,000 and, uh, and finished in 18 months, because what we have in Syria today really is a, is a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. If you are Syrian, of course. I mean, if you are, I don't know, South African, then your problems are elsewhere. Or if you're Congolese, you're, you have a different connector. But for us as Syrians, it is definitely now no more, or no, it is no longer the country that we knew or recognized. So with that kind of preamble in mind, I just want to run a few key issues by you to kind of bring you up to date of where we are today. As I said, this is my fourth um, attempt to speak here, so you know I'm assuming that many of you have some inkling of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the and the uh, the real question for us today that we face today, when here I am in you know February 2018, um, it was my birthday yesterday, so. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm thinking in terms of years. And it really, what started off as this very organic, very much sort of popular uprising, often when protests occurred back in 20, uh, 2011, they were to a great extent driven by local issues. So the great protests of the city of Homs actually started because of a very localized issue to do with a, 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 a project that sought to sort of uh, rebuild and, and, and redistribute a certain amount of land um, within the city. In Banyas, it was about uh, you know lack of jobs. In in Deir ez Zor, it was about drought. In Dera, it was about yeah. You know, it was a very localized, very way. And so, essentially, what I'm trying to say is that local Syrians the people of Syria essentially had a say in what was going on and the decision to go out to protest and even to escalate it to a military conflict later on in, in the end of 2011 going into 2012 where it does become an armed confrontation now fully between regime and opposition it was Syrians who were making these decisions albeit at various points with some encouragement and occasionally I'd say promises that should have never been made by international actors including the United States but nevertheless they were still Syrian decisions that's no longer the case today because if we look at the main protagonists the regime the Syrian regime, that is. The Syrian opposition in all its shapes, hues, colors. You know, quite, quite, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm lumping them. I'm sorry, I know you, it's sort of, but just for the purpose of this exercise here. And the Kurds. So these are, if you consider these as, the, as your three main protagonists. And by the way, the Kurds are not a monolithic block either. Um, you know, they're also very f uh, factionalized and fractured, and even though we tend to look at them as one block, like we sometimes look at this opposition as one block, or even the regime, we look at it as one block. Yes, they have one leader, the Assad, but even they are but a collection of different groups, warlords, um, entities whose interests happen to align with that of the regime. So you have the main protagonists, and then you have the key actors, or what I would prefer to call the, de the key decision makers, who today decide what happens on the ground. No more, no longer is it the Syrians. So when an offensive is launched, or when an action is committed, or when a, a, a meeting is held, Today it is invariably at the instigation of those key actors. And those key actors obviously are going to be the Russians and the Iranians as far as the regime are concerned. They really very much dictate why, where the regime goes and what it does. Um, as far as the opposition is concerned, particularly when we're talking about the opposition in the north of the country, um, the opposition in the south, it's a little more complex but I'm gonna focus on the north right now just because that's where all the action is so that's Turkey Turkey is the prime uh, decision maker there and then in the eastern part of the Euphrates all along that eastern part and the north um, you have the Kurds this is the territories that have now been uh, taken over by the what we call the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is supposed to be a a, a, a combined force of Kurdish and you know non-Kurdish, local Arab, Christian, and and and, and whatever uh, forces. But really, they are dominated by the Kurds and specifically dominated by what the 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 what they call the the YPG, which is the Syrian version of the PKK. 
a, a terrorist designated organization as far as the Turks and by the way the United States so why, why is this important why are these key issues important they're important because they represent to us a dynamic that is essentially shaping events on the battlefield and in ongoing negotiations so when you have a battle that begins or ends it usually begins or ends because one of those key actors has decided it needs it or wishes it or requires it or sees some benefit to its own strategy and then our main protagonists are merely actors in this scenario that is being essentially um, carried out and so really it is strategic interests of these key actors and domestic policies in many cases that are deciding what is happening on the ground today whether it's the battle for Afrin whether it is where and, and how long and, and, and what kind of territory the Kurds hold in, in the uh, eastern side of the Euphrates or uh, what offensives or what territory or what actions the Syrian regime uh, commits or even atrocities for that matter I guarantee you that these are all now essentially determined by those key actors based off their own strategic uh, interests and in many cases domestic politics so if we look at Erdogan in Turkey um, having launched this offensive against Afrin uh, you know we see from a domestic perspective his popularity has shot up recent uh, polls in Turkey indicate that uh, Erdogan's popularity has benefited from this uh, attack uh, the, this the, there's a rise in nationalist fervor and the idea of uh, make Turkey great again do not think it's just here it, it really is you know Erdogan is really pushing that you know the, the, this this whole idea of Ottoman you know re, re, reliving the glories of the uh, old Ottoman Empire and order and of course there are uh, elections um, invariably and that will help Erdogan in his uh, quest and finally on the strategic level obviously uh, you know if you look anything to do with Turkey has always has to be seen through the Kurdish lens and so um, you know as far as the Turks are concerned uh, having a, a independent or quasi independent strong Kurdish presence along their entire border would be strategically catastrophic and so for them they are actively engaged in limiting the ability of the Kurds to maintain that presence for as much of the border as they can they know that east of the Euphrates River is going to be tricky so if you look at the map here um, so this is Tur Oop, hold on, hold on. so there's the Turkey and there's Syria there's the Euphrates River so really anything east of that and the Turks are essentially uh, willing to tolerate but west of that over here they see this as a major problem particularly in Afrin over here where they have their own uh, issues uh, up here in, 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 in the Hatay region and therefore the, to them that is, an, is, is a red line so has to be addressed with Putin similarly um, again uh, he has the elections right now coming up so it is very important for him to be seen to be victorious um, he has a very he projects a very strong image of Russia you know uh, make Russia great again there's that old Tsarist sort of you know glory days uh, mixed in with a bit of the old you know sort of communist superpower uh, element in there as well so and and he's coming up for so his popularity is at stake his the elections coming up so again victory in Syria appearing to be decisive uh, strong 
is, is very important. And you know, again, their strategic interests in maintaining asset are, are clear, and I don't need to sort of go there um, in, into any details. And then the United States. Again, we have the Trump administration. They have elections, and Trump is very obsessed with his own popularity, as you well know. And we also have the Make America Great component here. So uh, again, American engagement in, in Syria has to be carefully managed in order to avoid any problems or any, uh, in, uh, or any sort of uh, appearance that somehow the United States is weak or that it is following in the footsteps of, uh, he is following in the footsteps of his predecessor, uh, i.e. Obama, who he spent, you know, much of the campaign sort of and, and previously attacking. And, and so that's important that that is maintained. And then as far as our strategic interests are concerned, I believe uh, there have been a number of uh, key statements made most recently by Tillerson and before that by uh, uh, people from, uh, you know, the, the White House, um, again, explaining where the United States strategic interests lie vis-a-vis -vis Syria uh, in that, uh, you know, obviously defeating ISIS containing uh, Iran and so on and so forth. So these, uh, and these would be achieved by essentially managing the Kurds. So where does that leave us? That leaves us, and I'm going to sort of finish off with that uh, briefly, um, with a quick update on the regime and on, 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 on the, uh, and on the, uh, on, on the opposition. Um, Essentially, the regime is in a period of territorial consolidation and uh, having made significant territorial gains in the east, um, particularly in this area, you can see now that the regime controls, uh, even from a year ago, uh, well over 50% uh, over of the country as opposed to let's say at the end of 2016 when it controlled barely uh, 29 or 30 percent of the country. So now they're around 55 percent of the country, maybe 60 percent, 55 percent I would say. So you can see that the regime has done significantly well uh, in the last year or so. And so they're consolidating these um, gains. Um, there have also been recent advances in the Idlib area uh, essentially right here, um, with uh, particularly using Iranian uh, ground troops and you know, Hezbollah, or Iranian back, Iranian trained Hezbollah troops, to push across further into Idlib. And if you look at the most recent maps, I think you can see that now almost a third of Idlib has been all but lost right here in the last, literally, four or five weeks. Um, so the, the regime is, is, is making significant advances. Um, but at the same time, uh, really, and, and, and we hear about an imminent offensive against the Southern Front um, uh, that is uh, likely to happen. However, um, I, 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 I cannot stress to you enough to tell you that you have to see these from within the lens of what the Russians and the Iranians are doing rather than seeing this as the regime taking the initiative on its own. Um, so essentially what we see here is a deal between the uh, Russians and the Turks where the Turks are given a green light. In, in, you know, Initially uh, for the Turks back in 2016, uh, late 2016, to capture this, uh, what we call the uh, Jarablus sort of pocket here, they had to give up um, Aleppo. Uh, so they withheld, they, they ordered, uh, they, they basically withheld support for the opposition in Aleppo, and in return for that, the, the, the Turks were able to carve up this territory, and therefore disrupting the efforts of the Kurds to connect their cantons together. And the latest round, what we believe has happened is that in return for the 
Turks being given the green light to go into here by the Russians, um, they have agreed to hand over this third of Idlib, allowing the regime to essentially advance to the... Uh, uh, these are the uh, Asitana 6 zones that I mentioned last time I was here. And so initially the regime was supposed to get this area only, and then this is supposed to be a buffer zone, and then the main opposition is over here. And now it seems that the regime has, will be allowed to take this part here. And this is the main uh, highway that literally runs along here uh, in return for the, uh, the, the, the Turks being allowed to sort of um, go after Afrin here. So you see the decisions are, uh, are being carried out at the strategic level, not by the Syrian regime or the opposition in terms of deciding what they want to defend. And, and as a response, we know that uh, the opposition, instead of fighting to, pr to protect its flank here, they're sending fighters to join the fight in Afrin in support of the Turkish attack. Again, that's, you know, it makes no sense for, as a Syrian, if I was thinking from a Syrian, it makes no sense to get involved in an Afrin um, offensive when I'm being attacked right along this line here and I'm having to cede all this territory. Um, but from a Turkish perspective, this is not important. What there is important to them is, is, is Afrin. And so it's what the Turks want that goes and not what the Syrians really need. Uh, I can tell you, however, that in 2014-15, when Aleppo was in, under siege, had that attack occurred on Afrin, that would have been a totally different thing because then you would have opened uh, lines of communication between uh, Turkey or the, for the opposition to bring in um, essentially supplies and, and resources into Aleppo, but that did not happen. Instead, Aleppo was handed over to the regime. And so, uh, and now again we see this happening here. As far as the opposition is concerned, um, oops, the, uh, again, really, the Turks have rearranged their priorities since, you know, the 2014, 2015, 2016, and now in 2017, um, uh, basically the Turks uh, see their priority as Afrin, and so resources are being diverted there. And in Idlib, particularly, um, the opposition never really recovered from their loss of Aleppo, and, and so um, their uh, situation is very fragmented and, and really very weakened at the moment, which makes, it all the, makes them all the more vulnerable, not just to attacks by the regime, but also vulnerable to being forced to essentially do what the, what the Russians want. Uh, sorry, what the what the Turks want, and that's by the way the same for the regime. In in that the the Syrian regime itself is also still very weak militarily, and therefore also vulnerable to pressure from both the Iranians and the Russians in doing what they want. Um, I'm going to leave the Kurds kind of hanging there because I'm not sure what Richard's going to say. So. Um, uh, if you are going to talk a little bit about U.S. foreign policy vis-à-vis -vis the Kurds, and then I can patch in uh, from that into there. All right. Thank you very much. This is the third time the three of us have come together to talk about this. And I was not one of those who early on thought Assad would fall early, as I'm sure Amir remembers we argued about that. Um, and I also was not one who criticized President Obama 
uh, for not getting involved in Syria uh, more. Um, and I did, I did think, though, that his uh, hope that Assad would fall uh, was, was a good thing. I, I was glad that he was supporting the Arab Spring. Uh, I was glad it, that he did that in Egypt at first. And I thought he was overly optimistic about what he could do, what would happen in Syria and what he could do there. And as he pushed this notion that Assad had to go, I think he put the United States in a position where he would have to deliver far more than it actually could. Because actually the promotion of democracy or human rights in the Middle East is fundamentally contradictory with U.S. policy and has been for 50 years in the Middle East. It, it, there are two fundamental U.S. interests that prevail in Washington and have for 50 years that will be threatened by the rise of either human rights or democracy in the Middle East, and that is the defense of Israel and the stability of the kingdom in Saudi Arabia. And the Arab Spring brought this into stark relief that you, uh, first in Egypt, with the rise of the Muslim Brothers, as soon as you had an election in Egypt, the Muslim Brothers and the Salafis won 75 percent. Uh, however, m maybe they should have only got 74 percent or whatever, but it wasn't even close. The liberal opposition got 14. And not because they weren't allowed to run. Nobody would vote for them. And it threatened Israel right away, which was opposed, very strongly opposed, to the U.S. policy of, of, in their view, allowing change in Egypt as if that was in the American ability to control that. Uh, and, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia, very early in the Arab Spring, invaded and occupied Bahrain. Still does occupy it. Uh, which I think was also very clear that the Arab Spring would threaten uh, Saudi Arabia. And it wasn't happy with what was happening in Egypt. It was working night and day to overturn the Muslim Brothers, which at the time were backed by Turkey and Qatar. Um, and in Syria, to deliver on this notion that, Ob that uh, Assad had to go, the United States would have to use a lot of force and involve in itself in a campaign that Israel would oppose, Saudi Arabia would oppose in some ways, that is if we were going to actually promote democracy, and the American public had absolutely no appetite for, having just spent a decade in Iraq and in the minds of most people having destroyed the country and achieved next to nothing. And so to think you're going to go to Syria, I thought, was sort of overly optimistic. And so you can tell, I have not been uh, uh, real optimistic about how Syria would turn out. I, I mentioned uh, the last time I spoke that this Lebanese civil war went on for 17 years. I, I think this Syrian civil war has that same potential. Uh, and maybe longer. Who knows? So all that gloom and doom, let me turn it around today. I was thinking, what can I do that's different? So let me try to put a positive spin on this, but I just have to change my perspective. Let's say you're not worried about the progress in the Middle East, particularly in terms of the metrics of human rights, democracy, or long-term stability of these regimes, but you're interested in two things. You want to defend Israel, and you want to defend Saudi Arabia's kingdom. Not the country, the kingdom the actual situation of the regime in Saudi Arabia today. If you look at it from that perspective, that that's what you're really trying to uh, maximize, then I'm not sure you need to be so gloomy. It looks pretty good uh, for the United States and Israel in the Middle East right now. Uh, on the Israeli front, if what you're primarily interested in, in making sure Israel is safe from Arab attack and doesn't have to deal with the Palestinian question, but can pursue a one-state solution, then Iraq in disarray. For a long time, when Iraq and Iran were at war, it was almost official American policy to hope that war went on forever. And we were openly explicit about that. So now, if Iraq and Syria are in virtual collapse, why is that bad for Israel? It's not. It's quite good for Israel. The more they fight with each other, 
the less time and energy they have to fight with Israel and the less capable they are. Ditto for Lebanon. I Iran has been thoroughly demonized as the culprit for the Arab Spring. Saudi Arabia obviously wanted to direct attention to Iran as the boogeyman rather than face the realities of what actually was driving the Arab Spring. And they've succeeded in the American discussions now, even on the liberal side, I saw this morning in the New York Times, Thomas Friedman's piece going all the way, says Iran now controls four Arab capitals, Baghdad, Damascus, um, Beirut, and I couldn't think of what he was, I guess he meant Aden or something for the fourth one. I wasn't sure what he had in mind uh, for the fourth one. So that's on him. Uh, but that's the mindset, even on the liberal side of America, that all of this uh, confusion and fighting in the Middle East these days is somehow Iran's doing, and Iran is the great beneficiary and is now running rampant across the Middle East, which directs attention completely away from what it actually is, which is a legacy of the Arab Spring, and demands for change from within and toward this, in my view, mostly fictitious uh, threat from Iran as if it was about to take over uh, the whole world. So it's pretty good, though, if the rest of the world is focused in that way, and especially good for Israel if the United States is focused that way. And if you can have the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is the official term for the thing that controls Iran's nuclear weapons, and say it's a bad deal at the same time, and therefore the rest of the world should even do more to to oppose Iran and put new restraints and constrictions on it, that's even better for Israel. They get the constraint on their nuclear program in Iran and maybe more as well. So that's going very well, I think, for them. Uh, and the defense of Saudi Arabia, um, well, there are, here are the problems for this view. So I could say if I were President Trump, I might be thinking this is going pretty well. Uh, in terms of defending Israel and defending the kingdom. There are some problems. Russia's in the region again. We'd like to get them out. Uh, that's, a, that's a price we paid because of uh, not getting more involved into Syria, I think. Assad's recovering. At least the regime is consolidating, not consolidating, it's gaining some territory. But if your main goal is just to be sure the thing never resolves, then the fact that he consolidates some it isn't a great threat. Iran's influence is increased uh, and has, uh, but I don't think as much as they say, as I've already mentioned. Uh, and Turkey's now introduced this complication. Turkey was initially fully opposed to Assad and determined to overthrow him and dominate Syria. It failed. It was also fully supportive of the Muslim Brothers in Egypt, and that failed as well. Uh, it then got crosswise with Russia, as you remember. It shot down a Russian plane when Russia first invaded and got involved in Syria. That's all turned around in the last 18 to 24 months. Uh, Turkey has decided that the real problem is the Kurds and that it can't allow a Kurdish autonomous zone, much less an independent state. And on the very week after we met last time, which was in the fall, the Kurds, of course, voted for independence in the national referendum in the Iraqi part of the Kurdish areas. So Turkey has made things more complicated now by using military force coming across the territory and invading uh, northern Syria to try to stop uh, the Kurdish efforts there. Uh, and the United States found that the Kurdish forces, as it did in Iraq, were our best allies because the Kurds are Israel's closest ally. And the Isra Israel doesn't make any secret. It's openly in favor of Kurdish independence and supports them, both in Iraq and I would presume they will in Syria as well for reasons I started out with. You know, the more you can divide in the, the Arab world and keep it focused on internal conflicts, uh, the better that is for Israel. And the last real threat, uh, if you're trying to defend Israel and defend Saudi Arabia, is America first. A domestic American attitude that actually has been in the political realm since I was a college kid, like some of you, 
uh, are now. But then the carrier of that banner was on the other side of the political spectrum. His name was George McGovern. And his primary campaign slogan, only us old folks will remember it, was America come home. That's all we talked about in the war, the opposition to the war in Vietnam. America come home. That was McGovern's primary, it wasn't America first, but it was America come home. It was the same sentiment. Get out of all of these third world conflicts. Stop this imperial behavior of the United States. Take care of your own. Trump's the modern manifestation of that, this time from the right rather than the left. And it's a great threat to those who want to keep the United States heavily engaged in a forward-leaning position in the defense of Israel and Saudi Arabia's kingdom. Because if the American sentiment would ever really America come home, then we would withdraw from those regions. They'd have to fend for themselves. So that would leave Israel deeply exposed uh, without many other allies anywhere in the world. And it would leave Saudi Arabia's regime to fend for itself internally. Uh, I, don't, I think which is it's a much greater threat than the likelihood that Iran's going to come across the Persian Gulf and try to conquer uh, Riyadh, which strikes me as just utter fantasy. So if you take it from this perspective, then maybe we don't need to be so gloomy. right? You can uh, have a more positive view as you would, I guess, if you were in Washington and thinking about this uh, just simply about American interests. Let me f say for a few minutes uh, what I think might happen next. Uh, I th think the most likely outcome is just continued stalemate and fighting. As Amar said, the countries that are deeply involved here now actually have no interest in making this thing stop. Saudi Arabia will fight to the last Syrian. Uh, so will Qatar. Russia has already withdrawn some forces, but it, it, this isn't expensive enough to Russia that it has to leave. And it's not going to give up its ally in the Middle East of now 50 years almost uh, and a secular socialist government to boot, particularly not when it has demonized Islamists in Chechnya and everywhere else and Putin has made enemies of Islamic radicalism as the primary threat uh, to Russia. So I don't see why he would leave at this point. Um, I don't think Turkey is going to allow the Kurds to be independent or uh, Syria to simply uh, go its own way. And yet, the, and the Turks can fight to the very last Syrian too. And they can fight to make sure that the other side never wins. That's what all these states can do. Now, civil wars tend to most often end when one side wins. I mean, those of us who study civil wars and how they end, they usually end with one side winning. I don't see how one side wins here. The, the countervailing forces are, are too evenly matched and too strong for one side to simply dominate the other because the outside forces are so deeply engaged at this time. If you look at Egypt, that potential civil war, to the degree it resolved itself, one side won. And it's just in killing and imprisoning everyone who opposes it. And it will sit like that. For, and that's how most civil wars end. In that case, it never even really got going because no one was willing to arm the Muslim brothers inside Egypt or the opposition to the army. In Syria, there were forces willing to arm the opposition to the army, mostly Qatar, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. And so you've had this huge influx of weapons into Syria over the last five, six years, and I don't think it's going to go away. When there are strong external powers intervening in civil wars, they tend to drag on and on and on. Not just this one, but that's the base rate. So if I was a doctor making a prescription and I've seen this disease 6,000 times, that's the typical outcome. It just doesn't get resolved because neither side can win and the fighting just perseveres. And as I've already mentioned, uh, the country that we don't have a whole lot at stake here, that is the United States. If Syria stays destabilized, that's good for Israel. It doesn't really threaten what we're trying to achieve in Iraq. It continues to make Iran easy to demonize. 
It doesn't threaten Saudi Arabia. So I can't imagine the president really getting all that exercised about this or being able to persuade a lot of Americans that we've got to go do something about this um, if the Syrian war just drags on and on and on. The only thing that nudged us a little was the refugee crisis flowing into Europe. If that reemerges, then conceivably he might be able to argue uh, persuasively. He, he doesn't need to persuade me, but he needs to persuade lots of people around the country, and I don't think he'll be able to do it without some kind of actual threat uh, to the United States from all of this. That in order to intervene with the kind of determination that it's going to take to try to uh, stop this. The way the Lebanese Civil War ended 17 years after it started was a complete Syrian invasion of the country and occupation. It, it didn't end because anyone found mutual accord or came to some peace agreement. It came because we got involved in the first Kuwait war and were distracted over there to liberate Kuwait. And in order to buy Syrian support for the American policy in Kuwait to eject Iraq and Saddam Hussein's regime out of Kuwait, we, we basically, and the Saudis, created a series of agreements at Taif and Taif II to say, look, Syria, end this thing in Lebanon. And they did. There could be a change. I think that not likely in Syria, for the reasons I've already said, although it's possible, and Amir has already outlined, uh, conceivably you could have Assad go and a transition council come to power that includes elements of the current government, particularly the security forces uh, that protect some of the minorities, like the Alawite and the Christians, and the opposition forces, and you'd have this council, but so far we've gotten nowhere. The talks in Russia uh, in the last month went absolutely nowhere. The opposition didn't even come. And the groups that Saudi Arabia support, Saudi Arabia said, you can't go. And so the State Department told me not to go. So I don't know if we, got, if we had this little room here and we had representatives from every one of the serious group, Syrian groups here, I, I, other than yell at each other, I don't know what they would agree to. I don't see how you put this back together, but that's what they'd need to do uh, if somehow someone could hermetically seal Syria from all foreign interference and let them get together. I suspect at this point they would all prefer revenge on one another. I, I really don't know whether they would try to create a federation, maybe with a Sunni or just a Sunni monopoly, because uh, it'd be the ob if you went to a democracy. Uh, my guess is Sunni and Sunni conservatives would win overwhelmingly just like in Egypt. And the uh, secular, merchant, uh, urban-oriented Syrian Sunnis who support Assad, right? they don't support Assad, they prefer Assad to the opposition and to ISIS, certainly. Uh, remember, there's a lot of secular-minded Sunni. Just look at Egypt and the army. It's the same in Syria, except even more so. The urban merchant class in Syria is Sunni. It's mostly Sunni, but it's very socialist and secular and has been for decades. It does not want Islamic fundamentalism rammed down its throat uh, by the Muslim brothers, who would be the most likely ones to win if you had a general election in Syria. So I don't know how you'd put that together. Um, there's probably one other possibility, which is change in Iran. I think the, um, and this may be what the Trump administration is hoping for. It's conceivable that with enough pressure on Iran, the regime there will crack. It's not popular. The U.S. is actually more popular on the streets in Iran than in any Arab state I can think of. The uh, Iranians blame their government for these last 38 years, not the United States. If you put enough pressure on Iran, if you supported the opposition there and the Iranian government changed somehow, that could be a huge catalyst to change. Right? The United States, traditionally Iran and Israel are allies. I Iran's not Arab, obviously and therefore it doesn't feel about the Arab issues the same way Arabs do. 
I can imagine then if the, if the administration is thinking that this regime is vulnerable, you could try to promote its overthrow through supporting of domestic uprisings. We saw some recently. Maybe you could stoke more. If you could bring that government down, that could allow a transformation in Iran, which would open to both Europe and the United States right away. That would scare Saudi Arabia, for sure. It would reveal that the real threat to Saudi Arabia is not Iran, uh, but domestic change inside Saudi Arabia. So I think Saudi Arabia is a little nervous uh, about all that, prefers the Iranian boogeyman. Uh, but just the same, I'm not sure. I can't quite read Iran right now and just how vulnerable and how close to any kind of change it really might be. But it does seem that, I, because I, I hear people around the Trump administration, the Foundation for Democracy and plenty of other groups in Washington who think it's quite vulnerable. And so even if it's not, I could imagine American policy that thinks it is and pushes in that direction very hard to try to make that the big catalyst of change that sort of creates the next big move towards something different in the Middle East. I don't know. Because there's the Iranians are pro regime. The regime is obviously Free. not the Syrian regime yeah. is at war with well that's it, it's, it's, it's against the Turks. So I didn't see it. I it was Martin think. Chulov's paper piece. I think that's the piece you're referring to. It's just that's the diplomatic. Yeah. I think this is on. Um, so the question was um, regarding a That was the answer to the question about. Why Iran wanted an invasion of a frame? No, no, they wanted. They wanted. They didn't want that. Okay. But I think the question yes, was more: Why was it just simply a, like a, a offhand statement? Is that what was surprising? That it wasn't more forcefully. Because, as I said um, in my talk, remember these actions occur in part by pre-arrangement. So the Turks would have never invaded Afrin had they not gotten the green light from the Russians. And the Russians agreed to that in return for allowing the Iranian-backed forces to move into the areas of Idlib that the Russians wanted the regime to have and the Iranians wanted. So Afrin was going to be the price. Now, how big a price and how complicated it is remains to be seen. These are not cut and dry. You have to think of it as you go into a restaurant and if you order a, a, a just a, a, an appetizer, you're going to have a small bill to pay. And if you order the full five-course menu, you're going to have to pay a much larger bill. So, and, and until you sit down and you order and you taste the food and you see how it goes, it's not going to be clear. So, but roughly, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing an attack on Afrin versus an incursion by the regime and its allies, i.e. the Russians and, and the Iranians, against Idlib. How much they take of Idlib, if they take too much of Idlib and not enough happens in Afrin, the Turks are going to get a little annoyed. And that shooting down of the plane is part of that power play of how, you know, just, just to make sure that nobody goes too far and a lot of messages are being sent in, 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 in within that so you you, you put you, you allow your side to go too far the Turks open the spigot and they let weapons in then the regime suffers setbacks then the Turks switch the spigot off and then the regime kind of and then everybody kind of steps back and says okay now where, where do we go a lot of it is like that and that's why I said really as Syrians there is we, we don't make the decisions anymore the Russians as well have been arguing since the, since the beginning of their involvement here that Syria has every right 
uh, to request external support under Article 51 of the United Nations. And so the intervention by uh, Russia to support Syria against Saudi Arabian, Qatari, Turkish uh, interference it has a certain legal legitimacy to it, uh, as does the Iranian role in uh, Syria, uh, in a way that Turkey's intervention across border does not, unless it was invited. Uh, and th there's still an effort on both the Iranian and the Russian part, and obviously Assad's, to say Syria is still the state. And we're not ready, they're not ready to walk away from this notion in the Middle East that state boundaries don't matter anymore, and it's just a new free-for-all. Uh, and that you can just move forces anywhere, cross boundaries anywhere, and that sovereignty is, is gone, which has sort of, has sort of become the de facto position of the Western world given the, our, the, the UN effort right to protect these kinds of things. And so my guess is that, that Iran wants to, it, also Iran doesn't want to see an interstate war, a direct interstate war, other than the Turkish shooting down of the Russian plane. And, and that's in the past. I have not seen Turkish forces engage against Russia. I have not seen Iranian forces engage against Turkey. I have not seen Turkish forces engage against Iran. These have been carried out through proxies. And I don't know whether they're worried that at some point the if Turkish uh, involvement in the region itself will become a direct war between Turkey and Iran. And Iran uh, could be signaling to Turkey, don't go down that road. Or don't go too far. One of the things that we have not discussed today is this country, Pakistan. Uh, here. Afghanistan is a landlocked country. Here is China, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Iran. The United States has only one route to supply Afghans and its own armies in Afghanistan, but 14,000 uh, troops in the NATO. So this is when President Trump cut, declared that he's going to cut about $2 billion per year to the Pakistan. In just exactly two, three days later, in Afghanistan, there were four or five consecutive terrorist bombings, which killed about 500 or 600 people. So this Pakistan can play hardball and then use this. Pakistan can choke Afghanistan anytime they want. That's coming back to the Dr. Herman's. It is true that in Iran, the Iranian regime is notoriously unpopular. And it's true that in the streets, the United States is more popular if someone will take. It's only the Pashtaran and Besiege which is keeping that regime in power. And you are absolutely right that uh, Iran uh, is very unpopular, the, the current regime in Iran. Any more questions? The brave one. Hi. Um, so in Freedom House's most recent report, they were talking about how they believed that the Assad regime's decision making was more um, based on the interests of the elites and it was very much about corruption and less about this actual Alawite versus Sunni divide. So I'm just wondering your guys' take on whether this sectarian um, kind of whether this hatred is real or whether it's just a pawn. Okay, um, I think you bring up a very, very important point here. And I think, uh, f to begin with, there is a narrative that has been uh, promoted, first and foremost by the regime itself, that, and, and not just since the beginning of this conflict, but for a very long time, that A, um, the regime is the defender of the minorities, and, and part because it plays the minority card itself in that, look, I'm a minority, I'm the defense, so any other minority in the country. And in doing so, it has also consistently attempted to uh, present this binary of either us or the evil ones. And in 2005, I believe, in a conversation I had with a senior regime member, um, then it was the Muslim Brotherhood that was, you know, so, so it was like either us or the Muslim Brotherhood. And there's no third alternative. There's no possibility that something other than those two could possibly emerge. 
and, and you or me, for example, as a secular person, had to choose, knowing full well that in their eyes my choice has to be them. And so part of what was happening in Syria in 2006 and 7 and 8, building up to the ultimate sort of uprising in 2011, was this unwillingness to accept that there is this binary and that's all we have. And so when the protests started, it was not simply Islamists going out against the secular regime. That, that is a false binary. That is not real. The opposition is not just Islamists. No more than the regime is just Alawite or secularist. There are secularists. There are Islamists who are pro-regime and not a few of them. And there are Islamists who are anti-regime for a variety of different reasons. And there are many secular people and intellectuals who are also anti-regime. But they're also anti-Islamists and they're anti-ISIS and so on and so forth. So just trying to present this as a simple binary is, is, is wrong. And what the regime did, as it has done consistently in the past, is it maintain? I mean, serious. The, the regime is 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 really very, very. Um, uh, I, I guess evil is the word, because it has consistently maintained a, a a coterie of radical Islamist movements that it has then used to send to Lebanon to destabilize Lebanon when it suited its its needs. It has used them to send them to Iraq when it suited its needs. Who do you think trained? Where do you think those radical forces, Abu Musab Zarqawi, the Al-Qaeda, the guys who were killing U.S. soldiers in 2004, 5, 6, 7, and then we had to put in uh, that, 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 um, that surge and, and, and Petraeus and all that. Who, where do you think these people were being trained? Where do you think they were getting their weapons? Where, th th this is, I tell you, there is a, a, a secret base, and I use the word secret in quote-unquote, uh, uh, in Zabadani. And it is so secret that if you get on the microbuses, which is the main transportation you know, in, in Syria, and you go up to the Zabadani area, you ask the microbus guy, drop me at the secret base. That's how secret that's you. This is where they were going, this is where they were being trained. Everybody knew about it. I was a professor at the university in Damascus in 2000, and four and five, but, but mo mostly at the end of 2004, I noticed that my classes, like you have a big, you know, sort of lecture hall, and I was losing students. Their students were disappearing. There were no students, you know, like their numbers were dropping. So, and I started, I just became here. I said, why am I missing so many students? And, and somebody said, don't you know, they're, they're going to jihad, to fight jihad in Iraq against the Americans. And then two days later, I was arrested and taken to the Mukhabarat. How dare you ask questions about this? I mean, th this, this is how this works. So the idea that this is some sort of sectarian war um, was essentially promoted by the regime, created by the regime in many ways, and stoked by the regime. It does end up being, there is now a very strong sectarian component, yes. But not because this was somehow because the asset is really secular or because all the opposition are, are, are Sunni. That's, that, that's a very false narrative and we need to stay away from that. Yeah, I, would like to I think we have five more minutes. Sorry, I'm sorry it took yeah, too yeah. long. But Saudi Arabia did the same thing uh, when the war was going on in Afghanistan. Wanted to get rid of its own radical yeah. Islamist groups. Many of them, including Osama bin Laden, was one of those that they just got them out of Saudi Arabia and then they were fighting in Afghanistan. Most of them, they, they covered the Arab Afghans. Syria, like Saudi Arabia, has never been a democracy. Assad was a dictator. The father was a dictator. Uh, I don't know what Freedom House is smoking. I mean, it isn't as if it transformed from Jeffersonian democracy to this. It was never a democracy. It was always driven by elites. And whatever it was when this thing began in 2011, it's very difficult to know what the identity structure is in 2018. After six or seven years of war, fighting, killing, nobody's doing census or surveys, nobody's out there in the field right now trying to understand what damage has been done to the identity communities over the last number of years. I agree completely with Amir about how it all began, 
but who knows what condition it is in now I agree. I agree. as a social community because there have been so much sectarian killing uh, at least in other places we've watched, even when it didn't begin that way, it usually gets that way uh, when people start lining up and fighting each other and killing each other's children and raping each other's sisters and mothers and wives. I mean, it, it just gets ugly, and it's been, it was that way in Lebanon, and it's just unbelievably ugly, and I didn't think I'd ever see ugly like this again, and yet here we are, right back at it. And so I would be... Just saying, I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if the sectarianism is pretty deep. Okay, thorny situation. We only have five more minutes. One more question in the back. Using the microphones recorded for our... I guess my question kind of relates to what you kind of started out with in terms of there being concern about people not really paying enough attention to what's happening to people of these countries trying to live there and, and make their livelihood. And so I was wondering particularly about um, Syria, but also Afghanistan, in terms of what is the state of livelihood or the ability for people to just live and function within Syria? Or do you think if this is as protracted and prolonged as what it seems like it might likely be, I mean, are we going to see, you know, starvation or people mass out-migration? Um, We've already seen all that. But I mean... To a larger degree, I mean, do you see that worsening? I, I mean, I can tell you right now that um, 50 percent, over 50 percent of the population of Syria has been displaced either internally or externally, mm -hmm. and that's unprecedented. I do not think in the recent modern history, post Second World War, there's been a conflict, and this is according to United Nations uh, numbers and statistics. Um, there has been a conflict that has produced this kind of humanitarian catastrophe. It's, it's, it's unprecedented. Um, it's, as far as food is concerned, starvation is one of the primary weapons used by the regime to bring areas not in, uh, essentially under its control uh, to, 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 to break and, and, and essentially accept their, 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 their um, rule. And uh, even within the areas under regime control, main areas, um, you, you obviously have people who are doing very well for themselves, but for the most part, and I'm talking about family members, uh, friends, etc., who are still living in Syria, um, they're finding it extremely hard. Their standard of living has deteriorated very significantly. And you just look at the, 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 you know, the, the, what's it called, the death rate when you die, the mortality. mortality rate. It has decreased by a, it has dropped by over 10 points. So. Yeah, the conditions are dire, and uh, it will. It is only going to get worse. In Afghanistan, uh, the United Nations statistics are telling us that about one third of the population, about 32 million, are facing famine. Um, if there is no international food by the by the United Nations different specialized agencies in the foreign countries, uh, many people in Afghanistan will starve. In most of those areas which are irrigated. And they are fertile. It is the puppy cultivation. Million, hundreds and thousands of hectares in Afghanistan is producing 90% of the world raw opium. And that's so because one, one hectare of puppy cultivation is equal to about 30, 40 hectares of, of wheat or barley or corn. So that's all controlled by the warlords in the powerful international mafia which is there and so that's what uh, the, the, the heroin trafficking is one of the, the most major things and it's really starving the people uh, so so it's a very like you mentioned that the the life expectancy is Afghanistan is the one of those countries two things literacy rate is going down it used to be 20 percent literate people and it's going down it's, it's getting worse and also the, the life expectancy and mortality rate and the birth, the, the women are, the mother is dying and the children are dying. This is the, the highest in the world probably, one of the highest in the world. Yeah, I just to follow up with that, it just oftentimes seems, and I know this sounds naive, or but it seems like we talk about these things in very political terms and I sometimes wonder if haven't we learned after centuries or millennia of this kind of behavior, I mean it just would be nice if we could have some kind of a mass planned mass exodus 
of common everyday people, mothers and children, to leave these areas and just let the big boys kind of fight this out. I mean, it's just heartbreaking to think of, of people, you know, caught up in this, in a hellish situation that none of us here in the United States, I think, can wrap our minds around unless uh, those of us that have been over there to serve. And so it's heartbreaking. I, I just wish that this conversation wasn't about political realities, but about humanity. Um, it's really heartbreaking. We have a common humanity, and the Syrian people and the Afghanistan, Afghani people should not have to endure this in this day and age. It is heartbreaking. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for asking. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.